the I Am A Woman podcast. I have Landon Starbuck back here for the show. And what an incredible guest she is. If you didn't have a chance to listen to last week's episode, definitely tune in. It's amazing how her story of leaving the entertainment industry to impact lives for the kingdom is so similar to my own. We have so much in common. However, she, where I, I have focused all of my efforts on teaching girls their value, identity, and purpose in Christ, Landon has taken a very deep dive into the issue of sex trafficking, human trafficking in the United States and really around the world. Landon, I want you to start by explaining to us how does this work? Last time we talked about how brainwashing and grooming can happen with our children simply from the concerts they go to, the iPhones. Uh, What about the actual business of human trafficking? How does it work and how can we even do anything about it? Right. Well, I mean, it's such a difficult uh, just concept to understand that it's, you know, $150 billion industry, uh, more revenue than Nike and Amazon and Target combined. I mean, it really is hard for people to wrap their their head around that. Um, But what I focus on is America. This is where I live. This is my home. This is our backyard. And we need to understand what uniquely happens here, why the demand to exploit and traffic children is so great here in America why there is an abundance to the tune of millions of people, mostly men, willing to subject children to this um, and view their abuse content and derive sexual gratification from it. So to explain a little bit of a difference, because sometimes we hear the term child exploitation and child trafficking, um, there's many ways to exploit a child uh, on trafficking. You know, there's been labor trafficking, there's been um, debt bondage, there's different ways. So sex trafficking of children, um, you know, involves uh, fraud and coercion and sometimes force, but it doesn't require force. Um, If a child is, if there's a monetary exchange for a child that is being uh, subjected to Uh, labor or sex, then they are being trafficked. And some people don't realize that children can be trafficked from a beautiful suburban bedroom without ever coming into physical contact with that perpetrator. Um, Because if there is a image or a video or something uh, being exchanged and there's a monetary exchange, then you don't have to have movement. You don't have to have transportation. That is sex trafficking. That is child trafficking. So when we talk about child exploitation, we're talking about the nature of the content and not necessarily the the charge uh, of child trafficking, because sometimes it doesn't meet the threshold because there isn't a uh, provable monetary gain or purpose for that exploitation. Sometimes the exploitation itself is the currency. Um, And so when we look at the epidemic of child exploitation online, we're talking about 32 million reports to NICMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, of suspected online sexual exploitation of children. So that is an epidemic, a pandemic. I mean, this is absolutely astounding that we are at these skyrocketing rates. And so we look at at demand and why is our culture different from other cultures? We normalize it. We have films like Cuties on Netflix. Our children are sexualized, are given social media where they're, they're exposed and groomed into sexual behaviors at a very early age. It becomes normalized. So it's no wonder that we have skyrocketing rates of children um, subjecting them themselves to uh, CSAM, child sexual abuse material that they're generating themselves. Um, That is happening at alarming rates. And the sad reality and how quickly it can cross over from child exploitation to trafficking is once that person you know, hiding as a as a boyfriend or a lover or whatever it is, once that person has one image of a child or even a secret that they can use to exploit that that vulnerability, once they can hone in on that vulnerability, they can get that child to do whatever it is they want. Um, and so that is what makes it so incredibly dangerous is that our children are inherently vulnerable. And that vulnerability, once, go, once that vulnerability checks online and has a profile, it is subjected to throngs of pedophiles willing to capitalize on that vulnerability. 
Wow. I've mentored uh, several girls who got caught up in child exploitation, maybe even did bridge over to trafficking if money had been exchanged, but from the point that they were very, very young. And the addiction, the pornography addiction that these girls end up with is just, it's, it, it's catastrophic to their self-image, to their identity. Um, wow. And it, it, it takes so much work for those girls to heal. So much work. It is yeah. really a lifetime of work because a lot of times they end up in same sex attracted relationships where they never, that they, they don't even necessarily want to be mm-hmm. in that world. And I think it's hard for people, especially in this culture of celebrating this type of uh, behavior, it's hard for people to even say, well, what, what is at the root of it? What is at the root of that homosexuality? It may not always be abuse, but in the case of the girls that I have, I have mentored, the same sex attraction came from exposure to porn. How do we, uh, well, 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 let's keep going down this, this road. So it's this, what did you say? How many billions of dollars? Uh, $150 billion industry what, and okay, counting. Okay, $150 billion industry. Are we at risk to this in our suburban neighborhoods, especially with, yes, I understand, through the iPhone. And I, 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 we 100% are, right? Because these kids are being groomed through the iPhone and eventually their hormones, everything else, their need for affirmation, they can get involved in it. What about riding their bikes? What about, I'm, I'm concerned about this because just as a mom, you know, my older son grew up riding his bike. Um, you know, they went fishing, they, they went places now that Biden has, has allowed so many people to come across the border. We're in Texas, so we're in a border state. Is it even safe for children anymore to do that, Landon? Um, I don't, I think that depending on where you are um, in your situation, I think physical threats are always a threat. Um, But the majority of cases that we're seeing are not the man pulling around the corner in a van. They don't have to work that hard. They literally just have to have a profile online or be a teacher at a school or have access to children or even a pastor. You know, the, the commonality here is they have access to children. So they are somebody the child knows. That is the majority of not only child sexual abuse, but what we're seeing with child exploitation as well. So whether they know them through a trusted relationship online, um, through somebody at school or through a friend, that is how they are grooming them into subjecting themselves in, in, in some ways to that exchange. So it's very high risk for a predator to go and physically try to find some random kid and throw them in their van. It still happens. Um, there's still, you know, sociopaths out there that, that do this, which is why physical threats will always be a threat and parents have to use their best judgment. You know, if I lived in a place with uh, Democrat policies, I would never let my kid go walk or do any of these things. Um, but luckily, you know, we live in farmland where all of our neighbors are farmers that are always caring, always looking out for our kids. So I don't particularly worry, but that was a choice I made to to live in that kind of environment because I wanted them to be able to do things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that every parent has to evaluate that physical threat. But the, but you know, it's not just social media either. You know, that's such a great point you made. It's also the schools, the grooming that's happening in schools because when they're subjected to gender ideology, okay, this is a synthetic vulnerability that's been created. Um, there are already risk factors with kids for trafficking and exploitation, like the work you do helping these kids that have a poor sense of confidence, broken families, maybe they have um, at home a single mom, a dad absent, uh, addiction in the home, poverty. These are all organic vul- vulnerabilities that have existed that allow predators to more easily identify and latch onto those vulnerabilities and exploit them, right? You need new shoes. Do you need a friend? But let's talk about synthetic vulnerabilities. When gender ideology is introduced in schools, when the sexual pleasure-based comprehensive sex ed is introduced in schools, we are now activating a sexuality that shouldn't be activated in a way that is centered around pleasure and exploration 
in some cases, giving them pornographic books, encouraging them to go to adult websites like Grindr to meet adults that can affirm their identity, to isolate them from their families, to keep secrets. And now in some states, they have legislation that can land children, uh, parents in jail if they're, they don't affirm their child's identity. That's so right. these vulnerabilities being created right now with gender ideology uh, are really dangerous. Um, and you mentioned something, you know, about your work with some of these girls. Mm -hmm. Well, girls are being sold a hyper pornified uh, version of a woman that gets spit on God knows what else on in these pornographic content that they're seeing. And then there's a generation of boys being raised in this pornographic content, which is sometimes introduced at school on these Chromebooks because they don't have accurate protections in place. So it's happening in schools as well with teachers that are grooming children into gender ideology, into this perception of what it means to be a woman that are completely fixated on these you know, misogynistic stereotypes. Um, and that is also destabilizing their identities. Their secrets kept at school about that, those identities, including sexual identities hidden from parents. Um, there are, you know, pornographic books that teachers are pushing onto children, that the libraries are pushing onto children, that in some cases encourage them to go onto adult websites like Grindr to meet adults to affirm their identities. So they're encouraging these websites that encourage them to meet adults. They're pushing this pornographic sexualized content in a pleasure-based sex ed called comprehensive sexuality education that is funded by Planned Parenthood in many cases, but um, it's, it's all over America. And so there's organic and synthetic vulnerabilities being introduced. Um, those organic vulnerabilities have always been poverty, addiction in the home, single parenthood, um, things to that effect. But now we have these synthetic vulnerabilities on top of that, which are this destabiliz destabilization of identity. And then you're separating parents by keeping secrets at school. These are all grooming behaviors. And now in some states, it is illegal for a parent to not affirm that child's gender identity that they learn through the social contagion and theory that is being normalized and accepted in education spaces, which is why are girls primarily being targeted? Well, they have seen pornographic content. They have a, a misogynistic view of what it means to be a woman. Why would any young girl want to be a woman seeing them get spit on and, you know, God knows what else in, in pornographic content and being treated certain ways by the boys that are groomed um, by this pornographic material and this idea that sexuality isn't good or bad and it's just about expression and do what makes you feel good. Don't judge anyone else. Keep secrets from your parents. It undermines every uh, value around sexuality, around procreation, around all of these things. So this is why our kids are increasingly vulnerable to then that need to for an adult to affirm them in a way that their family won't, which is why we hear so much talk uh, from this community of, oh, I'll be your mother. If your mom won't affirm you, I will. Wow. That was, that was an earful. And the thing is, what I feel when I think about, and because I get this, I understand what you're saying. It is 100% clear to me. I, I'm a daughter of a sex education teacher. My mother taught sex ed and wrote the sex education curriculum uh, that I under, that I went through in the seventh grade, okay, in California. What they are teaching in schools now is something she could have never in a million years have taught. I mean, they taught us male anatomy, female anatomy, the beauty of childbirth, healthy decision-making. I have read up and down the curriculum, my children uh, and people in our community are, are doing with our local school district. I've read through and through every single thing. And it sounds very similar to the program that my mother taught the one that is in our small town here in Texas. However, comprehensive sex education, is, is that what's being taught in California? Okay. So there's, yes, there's a new standard of sex education and they will do what they can to get away with you know, what they can in certain areas, but it's called different things. In Tennessee, it's called family life. Um, it might be called sexual and reproductive health rights education. Um, they will repackage it any way they can to get it through. And on paper, it says inclusive, you know, um, uh, medically accurate, scientifically sound, uh, uh, even called abstinence only curriculum, I saw that encourages pleasure based sex. 
That means that the focus of the entire comprehensive sex ed is focused on sexual identities, exploring your sexual identity. There's prompts in there that parents aren't going to have access to. And those prompts are, um, you know, who would you want to, what would be pleasurable to you? Uh, have you ever tried anal sex? I mean, these are the types of conversations teachers are having with our children. And this is what's being normalized. This is okay. And then abortion is also taught as a, a means of birth control, as a means of health care. If we have values at home and then we send our kids eight hours a day, and this is the kind of indoctrination they're receiving, we are undermining ourselves without even realizing it. And that's why so many of these young kids, parents reach out all the time saying, I raised my kids with the right values. They went to school, they went to university, and now they're a abortion rights activist. Now they are, you know, a far left progressive activist, uh, you know, and they want to sexualize children. This is why they have been trying to reach children younger and younger, even in preschool with masturbation lessons. They believe children are not innocent that this is a cis hetero patriarchal structure that they must break down. This is what moral relativism is. Wow. And the interesting thing about it is that if people like me and you speak out against this and say, this is not healthy, gender ideology is not healthy. I love the word synthetic vulnerability that you use to describe that because I, I haven't had that language. I teach identity. So I know that identity is not based on sexuality. It, it, it Your sexuality is not your identity. It's not your identity in Christ. It's your not identity in your parents' eyes. This calling a cisgender, oh, that's the whole reason why I'm doing this podcast. I'm not cisgender. That I, I, I reject that label. I am a mother. I am a wife. I'm a woman. I'm a sister. I'm a daughter. I'm a friend. I, I am not that person. Why the demonization, Landon? Why is it that when level-headed people like you and me, okay, this would have been my mother back in the 70s, she would have never written any of this stuff into the curriculum. Why is it that we, that people don't want to have this conversation? What, what, well, what I is it behind the, the need to demonize people who are saying, hey, this is unhealthy? Right. Well, it's the same thing we, we talked about on the other podcast. I mean, when you know that this is happening, it requires action from us and it's uncomfortable. Conversations are uncomfortable. It might even lead to pulling your child from this environment. And that's that's a lot for people to swallow. It really is because mm -hmm. it's a complete uh, upheaval of our lives in some ways to deal with the scope of this problem. But it is such a big problem. Um, and so, you know, with the education, I want to be clear that not everyone who is doing you know, their job, so to speak, is aware of the ideological motivations and, and sinister evil components that funnel down to the school, you know, to the community level. And it doesn't make it right that they're still pushing it, but it's important to understand these, this Marxist, this neo-Marxist ideology comes from upper academia and they set the standards for all American education. Now, sometimes if you're in a private school, there's there's wiggle room. You don't have to accept this. But in some states, they're requiring sex ed and they're requiring a certain type of sex ed. So it's it's important to understand that distinction. I'm not demonizing. I don't want to say that every teacher that's, you know, ha in a school, they might not even want to be teaching it. But the problem is, is these institutions have a stronghold, whether it's tied by federal funding um, or just the, the upper academic institutions that set these standards. So it's very difficult for a, a school to get out of this program. It is the work, the foundation has already been laid going back to Obama years, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, where they funded Planned Parenthood curriculums. Planned Parenthood started this in, you know, poor African countries, this sex ed. They essentially colonized these areas with our Western values of abortion and sex on demand, pleasure based sex. And they test piloted it out on these poor African countries. And the the effects of this were devastating. And so now that they've done that, they have they've been able to buy in 
more, you know, Democrat liberal states into this ideological framework, which now we know the academic institutions have been fully taken over by these radical pro progressives. So it's very difficult to opt out of this in some places. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's that's what makes this hard is, is parents will say, I found this in my school. What do I do? And, you know, it's not as easy as, well, you just march up there and say, hey, I found this. Let's get it out. I mean, you, it's so once you see the roots of, of how strong this foundation that they've laid is, it is very difficult. And I'm not saying not to fight back. If you can, in some areas, fight back with other parents. But the reality is, is that these these strongholds are very deep. The funding is there. We, we in some cases are tied to these federal funds and the, they won't deny them. So um, it is a very challenging thing. Education is the battlefield, I believe. You know, this is the uh, civil rights issue of our time, which is why I support school choice, because th that is the one of the ways out of this is mm -hmm. letting other schools rise up that do not want to push this harmful, toxic content to kids and letting those thrive. So there's a transfer of power. There's a transfer of wealth that has to take place for those uh, newer education systems to rise up. Wow. Wow. That, that gives you such a clear picture, you know, because we see these viral videos, right. Of these moms going up against the school board and we love them. We, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm behind them 100%, but understanding what they are truly up against, what, what would be your advice to a mother right now or a grandmother? You know, a lot, I think a lot of our grandmothers think their time is done and they're going to bake cakes and sew with their grandchildren. If you are basically a concerned citizen <laughs> of America, what is your role right now? Right. Well, I really believe at this point in time, a, a localism approach and inside your home, out into your church, out into your community approach is really the best way. Praying for Washington to clean, self-clean its own swamp is just not going to happen. Um, we cannot wait for other people to fix these problems. So from our own homes, what our kids are exposed to, the environments, the education, you know, the, the social media, the edu the entertainment, every aspect of that, and then work our way out, okay? If our children are safe and secure, now we can fight for other children as well in the school systems that our children aren't even a part of. Um, and in some areas, it is worth the fight, right? If you can, if you live in a red area and they, you have a, school board that can can beat it but again you know it's it's using discernment in your own area because if you're in a very blue area unfortunately you are not going to get rid of radical sex ed you are not going to get rid of sel you are not going to get rid of crt it doesn't mean to try to run for the school board and replace them but you have to be realistic that this is the time we're in these people are taking over pockets and so that is why it's really important if you do live in a red area to fight back where you can to preserve the schools, to get rid of that federal tax money to those academic institutions, like what uh, Ron DeSantis has done in Florida. They have, they're have they laying the roadmap for other states to follow of how you fight back. So we should fight back, but we have to be realistic at the same time. And I'd rather see a mom with their precious time expending it in areas and say, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm protecting my kid. They're not. I'm not exposing them to these environments that I can't change overnight. And I feel like that is some some cases will save them so much time and energy and headaches because you're just playing games of whack-a-mole. You get one book removed and then they put another one in. You get one teacher removed and then they put another radical teacher. You get one curriculum and then they put another one in. And by the end of it, these parents are exhausted. Mm. So there is a better way. We do have choices. And so that that is what you know. I would encourage parents to really use discernment and say, do I have the energy to fight this battle? Is this battle winnable? Is it necessary? Or do I remove my child and build something new and beautiful and put my energy and resources to creating rather than just trying to fight, fight, fight something where the, the you know, the wall of Jericho is built so high. Um, so that that is my advice in those situations. Wow, that's brilliant. And it's so good. And it's so basic. It's so basic because we start in the home. We start with our own community. And for me, it's knowing what is being taught in my community, what is being taught in my schools, yes. talking with the teachers, the parents showing up at the school board meeting. I know here in Texas, we had 
200 parents, you know, at the school board meeting, we're check, you know, we're reading the sex education curriculum. The moment it tells me that my son can be a girl is the moment I'm gone. I'm gone, you know? Um, so, so, so helpful. What do you think is the impact of the gender ideology on the mindset of these girls? You know, my heart is for the young girls in teaching them their identity in Christ. What do you think, how do you think this impacts their brains when they're being told that your identity is a feeling, Landon? It's based on feelings, feelings that change every single day. Right. Well, and it's not being sold as just, you know, this utopia. It's also that our innate femininity is being demonized. The innate masculinity of boys is being right. demonized. Right. So it's our, you know, our identity is under attack. They're not just trying to introduce a new one. They're trying to actively dismantle um, our natural identities um, and undermine, you know, this, this notion that every child is born in God's image. Um, if they can remove that belief system, they can introduce any idea because their identity is already deconstructed. And um, that is why they attack faith. That is why we see religious persecution. That's why we see it demonized and discredited on a regular basis is because if they can remove that, they can get everything else done. These ideas aren't actually popular. They're not even scientifically sound. The outcomes don't speak for themselves. The, the objective reality doesn't corroborate their ideas. And so they need right, to destroy right. something good for them to take hold, to, to drive these identities into a state of dependence. Because if you've, you know, destroyed the confidence of a young girl and the identity, then, then they are dependent on that same teacher, on that same authority figure to give them the solution, on that doctor to say, but I know what can help you. You know, if you take these hormones, if you block puberty, because it's going to be really hard on you if you have to go through a period. Oh my gosh, it's painful. It's miserable. You don't have to go through a period. Who told you you have to go through a period? Wow. You know, if a young girl is being told those lies, they're not going to sign up for a period. They're not going to sign up to be a pornified young woman that they can never rise up to these beauty standards of what they've seen. They're going to opt out for the easier path, one that they won't be sexualized in, one that they won't experience painful periods. And, and that is why so many young girls are choosing that. And so it's, that's how it's being sold to them. Yeah, it is so sad to me that femininity and womanhood is being reduced to periods and sexual feelings, uh, especially yes. with the study that I've recently taken my listeners through on what God says a woman is, that she's one to announce, she's one to proclaim, she's one to perceive, she's one to bring life. Uh, it just, it absolutely breaks my heart that these young girls are viewing femininity and womanhood through that lens of pornography and through a lens of misogyny. Really, I don't want yes. to be that. And yet at the same time, I understand why. Because we weren't raised with those images. You know, we didn't see that. We were raised with mothers who were, my mother was a working mother. She, she cooked pie and pumpkin bread and kept an orderly home. And in my case, I had an example of really positive, empowering femininity for the most part, but so many of them, and this is the experience I had, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. But when uh, I saw that March in 2017, the, the women's March on Washington, I was, you know, where they all wore these pink hats and, you know, representing their feminine body parts, pretty demeaning. But when I saw that, I was so, uh, it was such an angry picture of womanhood. And mm -hmm. I have felt that God has called me to elevate positive fem femininity and positive womanhood and to raise that as a standard. So I love what you're saying, because the truth is we cannot change all these deeply rooted systems, but we can teach our daughters who they are. We can teach our sons 
healthy masculinity and we can hold up a banner of positivity really for these girls because I really believe they will flock uh, to the voice of the bride. They will flock to the voice of Christ because when they understand what their value is in his eyes, they're going to want to be a woman again. <laughs> so I'm, yes. Uh, yes. So I'm going to close, uh, our time. I know we could talk forever, but first of all, how can my listeners follow you and how can they be involved in your work, Landon? Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, they can follow me. Landon Starbuck is my social media handle on Twitter and Instagram uh, and, and Facebook as well. Uh, and they can go to my website, landonstarbuck.com. Uh, but most importantly, my nonprofit, my ministry, freedomforever.us. We work tirelessly every single day to protect children, to identify the grooming, to reduce the demand, to do the work that has to be done, and to educate parents and how they can be effective act activists and warriors for children as well. So we invite everyone to join us um, at that website. Awesome. Okay, we're going to close the show with the same question I ask every single guest. What is a woman and what is our call in this hour? A woman today is a warrior for the kingdom of God. And a woman today does not make concessions or collaborations with the enemy or, uh, you know, compromises, you know, with lies. We will not live by lies. And no matter how little, how small, how insignificant, and we are fearless. We are not afraid to be uncomfortable. In fact, we welcome it and embrace it because our pain can be used as strength. It is the one of the greatest things that propels us to rise to any challenge is because God made us warriors. We are child bearers. We can navigate any pain and any obstacle because God is for us. And if he's for us, nobody can be against us. So if we walk in that truth, we honor him and we have to be fearless and unafraid of what the world does about or the enemy says about who it is we are, what our role is, and just charge forward. So when we say yes to that divine role being assigned to us at this unique moment in time, we become the Debras. We just put blinders on to the world, the noise of the world, and we know what our mission is. We are clear on it and we support one another in that. I love that. I need to have you in my ear all the time, <laughs> reminding me. Thank you so much for being uh, the, uh, my distinguished guest today on the I Am A Woman podcast. This has been an amazing conversation. And everyone listening out there, follow Landon Starbuck. I am telling you, she is going to open your eyes to the grooming and to the trafficking and to what's going on in the schools. And it may not be pretty, you may not want to see it, but right now, you guys, we need to see it so that we can truly be a light in a dark place and do our part in extinguishing this darkness. I am so grateful that you came on the show today. Thank you so much, Landon. 